Welcome everybody to the webcast series, The Public Health Insider. Uh, my name is Casey Farm, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations for the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. I am delighted to introduce today's moderator for the episode, Back to School Expectations, Transitions, and Challenges. This is the first webcast of our fourth season of the Public Health Insider series. So if you are new to the series, we've had some previous episodes. Uh, if you're a returner, welcome on back. Uh, you can always register for any episode of this season or watch previous episodes from previous seasons at osualum.com slash public health webcasts. Um, a couple of logistical items. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you will find a Q&A chat button. You are welcome to type questions throughout the talk and at the end of the presentation, our panelists will answer as many as they can before the end of the episode. So as you're thinking of things, please feel free to type them in. Um, our webcast is hosted by the OSU Alumni Association in collaboration with the OSU Foundation, the College of Public Health and Human Sciences and the OSU Center for Health Innovation. We are very excited to return this series. Like I said, it's its fourth iteration surrounding public health and human sciences, what it is, why it's important, and how it applies to our lives and our communities. For more information on public health and all the other incredible work that's being done in the college, please visit health.oregonstate.edu. Now on to today's moderator who introduced the topic and our panelists. Our series moderator um, is Dr. Allison Myers, and she is the director of the OSU Center for Health Innovation within the college. The center serves as a connector between external organizations and Oregon State University faculty in the discovery of innovative solutions to pressing health and wellness issues, and it builds workforce capacity in public health and human sciences. In service to meeting the most pressing public health needs in the state of Oregon, the center is home to projects related to the COVID-19 response, including Trace OSU and Trace Community, mental health promotion and substance use prevention in rural Oregon, and improving food security for Oregon Health Plan members through store-based changes. It is at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our pan our web, our, excuse me, our, our um, Dr. Allison Myers, our moderator. Nice to see you. Moderator. Glad to have you back. I had to think about your title there for a second and it just went right out the door. So Dr. Myers, please take it away. No problem. Thank you so much, Casey, for the for the introduction. I um, welcome everyone. I can't believe it. This is it. This is our 10th gathering of, of the webcast. And um, it, you know, we do a lot of Zoom meetings, uh, most of us uh, these days. And so this is not your typical Zoom meeting. And I really like to invite folks who are on the call to come on in, take a couple of deep breaths, make sure you have a coffee or a tea or uh, you know some way to sort of close out the day. Uh, this, this episode is going to be a really good one. We, uh, we've been joking that we're getting, we've got the band back together. We have um, all of us actually, our offices are down the hall from one another. We haven't been able to be in person, but at least we get to gather today. And the topic is back to school, expectations, transitions, and challenges. There's a lot going on uh, in the world out there. And the three uh, speakers that we have today are really gonna offer um, a perspective on what's happening and a lot of strategies for kids, for parents, for families, for uh, breathing humans uh, about how we can promote health and well-being in our lives during this during this time. So let me give you our agenda. I'm going to introduce the speakers. Then they're going to do a mini lecture on back to school. And then we're going to open it up to questions. Uh, so for those of you in, in the audience, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, please be thinking about what it is uh, that you'd like to know. And, um, and we'll, we'll go from there. So I'm going to invite Shauna, Megan, and Megan to go ahead and turn their cameras on. And I am going to introduce all of you. Our three speakers today are all faculty from the Hallie E. Ford Center for Healthy Children and Families that was established, uh, the building at least in 2011 uh, on the Oregon State University campus. And the Hallie Ford Center for Healthy Children and Families promotes the development and well being of children, youth, and families by generating, translating, and sharing research based knowledge. 
The center advocates a holistic interdisciplinary approach to research, training and outreach that has far reaching consequences for Oregon and beyond. So thank you for all of the work you do. There's a lot going on. The Halley Ford Center has a website. Maybe we could put it in the chat. Um, so let me introduce you. First, we have Megan McClelland, Megan Wave. Uh, Megan is the Catherine Smith Professor of Healthy Children and Families Scholar in the OSU College of Public Health and Human Sciences and serves as Endowed Director of the Halley Ford Center. And Dr. McClelland's research focuses on optimizing children's development, especially as it relates to children's self-regulation, early learning, and school success. Her recent work has examined links between self-regulation and long-term outcomes from early childhood to adulthood, recent advances in measuring self-regulation, and intervention efforts to improve these skills in young children. Uh, Dr. McClellan works with colleagues and collaborators around the world, that's for sure. So if you've got questions about the global nature of the work at the Halley Ford Center, we'd love to have them and is currently involved with a number of national and international projects to develop measures of self-regulation and improve school success in young children. Megan, I know it's uncomfortable to have folks read your bio, but welcome. Thank you so much for being here. We also have uh, Dr. Megan McDonald. Uh, yes, Megan Mick and Megan Mack, uh, Dr. McClellan and Dr. McDonald. Wave high, uh, Megan. Is, uh, Dr. McDonald is an associate professor at our OSU College of Public Health and Human Sciences and the OSU Impact for Life faculty scholar in our college. Uh, Dr. Mc McDonald uh, earned her PhD in kinesiology from the University of Michigan. And in all of her work, uh, Dr. McDonald stresses that movement and physical activity are essential components in a healthy lifestyle for individuals of any age and ability. Dr. McDonald's research interests are related to how motor skills and physical act, physically active lifestyles improve the lives of children and youth with and without disabilities. She has a specific research interest in the movement skills of children with autism spectrum disorder, including how to improve motor skills for children with autism and how motor skills interact with social communication skills. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. McDonald. And our third speaker, Dr. Tomini, Shauna Tomini, Assistant Professor of Practice and Parenting Education Specialist uh, in Family and Community Health Extension and the OSU College of Public Health and Human Sciences. Uh, Dr. Tomini is an Assistant Professor of Practice and Parenting Education Specialist Scholar in our college, and you're serving as the Principal Investigator for the Oregon Parenting Education Collaborative, an initiative to provide high quality parenting education to families with children of all ages across the state of Oregon and in Siskiyou County, California. As a former early child teacher, early childhood teacher and parenting educator, Shauna blends practical experience with research to develop programs aimed at promoting social emotional skills for children and the adults in their lives and is co-developer of the Red Light, Purple Light Self-Regulation Intervention. Shauna is the author of the book, Creating Compassionate Kids, Essential Conversations to Have with Young Children and a regular contributor for PBS Parents. You all, warm welcome. Thank you so much for being here. At this point, we're gonna turn it over to a mini lecture. I'll mute myself, um, Megan McClelland. You'll share your screen and take it from there. Wonderful, thanks. Thanks for that great introduction. So nice to be here with you guys. It's almost like we're in the center. We were just saying, usually we're all next to each other and not, not right now, but it's almost like we are. So this is gonna be really fun. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and start a little bit with our presentation, which is called Back to School Expectations, Transitions and Challenges. And can you all see this? You are, okay. Um, so I just want to make sure, let me know if it's not transitioning for some reason, okay? Um, so I'm the director of the Halley Ford Center, and then along with my colleagues and I, we um, are really have lots of expertise around some of the, the expectations, the challenges, ways that we can support children and families as we move back to school within this COVID era 
And for many children, that is um, like, for example, my son who just is in sixth grade, just went back to school today for the very first time in nearly, uh, in over a year. And, um, and I just wanna, someone's saying that it's not resuming share. So let me try again, you guys. Remember, did we do this before? I feel like this happened before. Okay, let's try. Um, my son, for example, just went back to school for the first time. It was, felt like his first sixth grade um, in, um, in September, but here we are in middle of April. So it, it's been a very strange thing for us to go back to school for many children and families with lots of um, challenges, with lots of things um, people are worried about. Um, there's lots of also increased um, attention for very good reason on social justice issues for also things that children are seeing in media and news reports, even today uh, with school shootings. So there's lots of things that are um, really getting uh, children's attention and families' attention that make this issue a very important one. Um, all right, so is that progressing okay, everybody? Hooray. <laughs> so I'm gonna quickly walk through, we're gonna take turns and just lay out some of the challenges that have emerged for children and families over this past year, especially those that have been really um, re perhaps remote or even the ones that have been back in school. There's increased stress and anxiety. Um, children that are not with other kids has been very challenging. There's been in general, because the way that for many children in Oregon anyway, um, have received their school education and um, school experience over the last year, it's really been through a remote Zoom kind of format. There's really been a lack of physical activity for young kids um, and needs associated with this. Many families, many educators, children are very concerned about this issue of learning loss. Um, that differs um, very much. We can talk a lot about that. It differs for, depend, for children depending on uh, where they are. Uh, often it hits children from marginalized communities or children that are growing up in a context of, um, of risk. Those learning losses may be more exacerbated. We have seen a heightened attention to social justice issues, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for very good reason. And all of these things are really important to talk about really upfront because they really are linked with how children are able to engage in school and how they're able to do academically. So I'm gonna turn it over to Shauna and she's gonna jump in quickly and talk about how stress shows up in children. So with all of these challenges and more, others that families are facing as well that we haven't listed out today, but we know many of you, I see lots of names actually from the OPEC initiative who are here joining us today. Many of you are working directly with children and families or school systems or your own ch children yourself are experiencing a lot of different challenges that are emerging, that are overlapping, some that existed before the pandemic and some that have been in response to that. We've seen over the past year different ways that stress is showing up for children and youth and quite honestly sometimes for ourselves as adults too in terms of sometimes this comes out in the form of tantrums or or that feeling of clinginess or increased anxiety we've also seen increases in depression particularly in youth sometimes that looks like more tears or difficulty sleeping changes in long standing patterns changes in behavior asking for help on things that students or children or youth can typically do on their own, but maybe want that extra support, want that extra closeness, needing more time to complete tasks, or even heightened reactions to situations that, particularly for us as parents or educators, when we're looking at the weight of the world around us and somebody has a meltdown over not finding the shoe they wanted to wear, feels like it should be no big deal. But at the same time, recognizing that we're all carrying so much stress and sometimes it's the little things that can push us over that tipping point. Megan, if you don't mind advancing. Oops. One of the things that we know about that stress response, which sends us into that fight or flight state, which makes it harder to think, harder to make good choices, when we come out of that mode, and I'll also say actually that being in that mode can help us. It can help us react quickly. It can help us advocate. It can help us overcome a frustration, but it also does make it harder to make good choices, harder to connect, harder to interact in a positive way. 
What we do know about those moments when we're coming down from that stress mode is that social relationships, positive connections, being with people we care about actually help us calm our stress, helps reduce anxiety, helps reduce depressive feelings, and goes into a cycle of drawing us closer together. So when we're stressed, we actually seek out support that helps us calm down. And not only that, but there are health ramifications that social connections, social closeness can help heal damage that happens physically in our heart and in our other systems in our body when we experience that stress. With the pandemic, we have physical distancing that is then taking away those natural moments we have when we pass a colleague in the hallway, when students are playing or wrestling out on the playground, when friends are getting together and just laughing or having a good time together in the same space, we are missing some of those natural connections to reduce our stress. And we're missing some of those natural connections for healing, which makes us all the more challenging. And that relates to us having some changes in, as we think about, you know, making sure that her son is going back to school. My daughter has just started going back. School is going to look different. And I'll mention one quick thing about that and then hang it, hand the slide over to our colleague, Megan McDonald. In terms of anxiety with being around people, because it's been safer for us physically to stay away from others, we've been teaching ourselves and our children to pay attention to any anxiety we have around being around people. So if I see someone coming in the grocery store, I step aside, I move away. I lean into that anxious feeling of making sure I keep separation. As our children are going back to school, we're teaching them to pay attention to that. Don't get too close, stay away, stay six feet apart. Now the regulations are three feet apart, stay away. Our children start to link or can potentially start to link that anxiety and those anxious feelings with social connections or with their relationships and friendships. And that's something we'll have to think about moving forward and then going forward beyond the context we're in right now. Megan McDonald. Thanks, Shauna. Um, so Shauna really touched on that third point um, that we want children, that children to consider as children are returning to school and a couple of others um, as, as, we, as we phase back, as we phase back to, um, back to school and really for kids, that's really back into their community. Um, social interactions will look different on the account of physical separation, but it's also an opportunity to remind our, our children and our students that are in school that we we have actually been practicing this. Um, we know how to do this safely now. I mean, I think as we're phasing back um, in, in our communities, we're realizing that we, we we know more about um, the virus at this point. We know how to put safety measures in place. And I think it's important to reinforce um, that the kids, that our kids know that as well. And it might also be more challenging to read emotions behind masks, um, to express feelings through masks and to connect. And so a few, um, a few tips and tricks to sort of think about that. There are masks that have um, clear clear patches in them. And that might be something, I know I find myself in the grocery store sort of looking at someone or making eye contact and I'm smiling underneath my mask. And then it takes me a couple seconds to realize like they don't know that I'm smiling at them or that that's my natural gesture in that particular context. And just kind of relearning that. So for some children, um, having a little clear patch um, in their mask might be something, um, and not an exposed mask, but an actual clear patch uh, might be really helpful for some of those children. That's actually also going to be helpful for some children who are hard of hearing um, or who have, um, who have difficulty with hearing, who might be reading more into gestures and body language of other students. Um, and also it's an opportunity to really remember that we, we express um, our emotions in many ways, including um, our body language and gesturing, but it's a reminder that we can also really express our emotions with language too. So some things that might be more, um, more common, like me smiling at the person that I'm walking beside or passing in the grocery store, it might be an opportunity to remind myself that I can say hi. And for children phasing back into schools, to really use their language as well um, in that particular context. So I'm going to turn it back over to Megan McClellan. And then I think Allison, as we as we take questions. 
Great. We have some strategies that we, we can walk through if people would like, or just take some questions. I think at this point, we were going to end our formal presentation and just encourage if you have other follow-up questions at the end of our session today, we're happy to, to talk more about them. And um, in the meantime, we thought this would be fun and maybe more interesting if we kind of took some questions um, from Allison and from the audience in ways that we can help support children and families as they make this transition back to school. So with that, I'll stop sharing for now, although if we want me to put slides back up, um, we have some that we can share too. Thank you so much, y'all. You've done such a nice job of, of talking through the problem. And I have to admit that, that even as an adult, right, to see that more tears, feeling sleepy, taking extra time on, completing tasks, you know, like we've talked a lot actually on the public health insider on this webcast about sort of ushering in that sense of gentleness, like how, how do we cope in a pandemic, we make sure we realize that we remember that we are coping in a pandemic, right, that is one good lesson, but can you all talk more about strategies for parents, you know, what is it, how do we, how do we do this, how do we move ahead with as much compassion and success as we can. Do you wanna go first, uh, Shauna or, or Megan? Did someone, I'm not to put you on the spot. <laughs> Happy to, I think we're all eager to jump in with strategies because we're all, you know, we, every time we get together or we talk about the pandemic and the social context that we're in today, so much of what we do is, is draw into that space of stress and of concern. And this is the part that brings us all hope, right? that resilience and those strategies of what we do. Um, Megan, do you wanna share the strategies slide that we have? That might be a good way for us to organize and pull together some of the things that we have shared across us. I'll try to save some of the things I know, Megan McDonald, you were gonna talk about for you. But some of what we're all thinking about in this realm, really for students of all ages is, Megan McClelland mentioned earlier, concern about learning loss. What are we often talking about when we talk about learning loss? We're often looking at those traditional academic skills like literacy, reading, math, that's important. Those are skills that are important, but they're one set of skills or, or a grouping of skills that are the easiest to measure, which is why it's easiest to look at those as the skills that might be lost over this year, rather than really looking at what are all the skills that can also be gained alongside in growth through resilience and thinking about how is it that we have been teaching our children and how can we continue to teach our children to tackle challenges in different ways over this year, thinking about what are all the things that our children, our students have learned related to surviving a pandemic, as you were saying, Allison, what are the ways that they have had to be creative to spend their time when they're not in school physically? What are the ways that they've gotten creative in staying socially connected with their peers or asking and answering questions? There are so many different skills that we can embed into our day, into the conversations we have that really are a part of learning and will help them thrive as they go back into school as well. I didn't touch, I often focus on emotions and how we help children recognize and manage their emotions, but Megan McDonald, I think you were maybe planning to touch on that. So I'll pause there. Well, I also think that um, in this time too, another strategy that um, is for children, but again, like, like all of this, it's really for all of us is the importance of physical activity and things that we know are working for us right now. And so there are, again, there are things that we know right now, we know that being outside has a really low risk. And so those are spaces where um, we can be protected and feel safe and mask up as well with more with people who are outside of our outside of our household, but um, maintaining that time outside or getting out of the house, we're spending a lot more time in front of screens, uh, myself included, um, a lot more time in our homes and just really recognizing that um, 
the, the importance of kind of creating some of those new habits and they've changed. Those habits have changed um, over this year. Um, um, I'm an associate professor of kinesiology and physical activity is something that is, uh, is valued and very important to me. And um, I was able to maintain it, maintain it over the pandemic, but it looks much different than it did over a year ago. And so I've had to find ways to work that in and, and, um, and the same for kids, right? So after dinner, going for a family walk, taking a break during the day to sort of help with some of those transitions in between classes. Children are, many children are going to be getting PE as a part of their academic classes. Um, and so virtually like taking some of those lessons and practicing at home or as a family as well. So that that is something that can really help um, our social and emotional health and, and really our, our self-regulation. It's something that I used um, pre-pandemic to help with my own self-regulation. And I think that it's something to just remember in those times when we have a lot of anxiety or a lot of stress. Megan, I have to say one thing because just to add in here, because when you talked about like doing it as a family, I mean, I just have to share a quick um, anecdote about this because my son is is usually absolutely not interested in doing the PE the on Zoom. And um, but I will tell you a funny story was he got um, really uh, interested in these orange theory classes. And all of a sudden it became an after dinner, we all have to do orange theory at seven o'clock at night. And <laughs> <laughs> it has worked for a while and now he's he's lost interest. So it's a really good time for him to go back to school because he's really not doing the PE things and neither am I. <laughs> I I think that's great though to do activities as a family and learn like what's new that we we've learned during this time. Oh, this family activity at 7 p.m. is something that you know, we all enjoy and finding ways to incorporate that. And, you know, I'd be, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the other thing that's happened um, over the course of the pandemic is that we, many of us who already have pets, have pets, and a lot of new pets have entered the household during this time too. And they require exercise and they have habits that are different than ours. And, you know, oftentimes in the household, it's the adult who takes responsibility for those animals. And so, you know, sharing that responsibility with children is really important and um, not only creates opportunities for physical activity, like the dog that needs to be walked or played with in the backyard, but um, also, um, you know, some, some bonding with the, with the family pet as well and, and uh, opportunity to just take on some additional responsibilities. So um, lots of, there are so many ways um, that we can be, that we can be active. And, and I think too, it's really important to remember for kids, like it doesn't, it's not something that just happens really quickly. These are skills that we build and develop and practice um, over time. I think those family pets are having a dog has been a lifesaver for my daughter, who's an only child. You know, she has a, a dog sibling, essentially, who she snuggles with on the ground and plays with and takes care of and takes responsibility over. And that has been such a wonderful thing for her as she's felt stressed and isolated. I think that the point that you just made too, Megan, around that these are skills to build in practice is so important. And that relates to skills around emotions too. There was a question I noticed in the chat box around how do students or adults alike get over the anxiety that COVID has created that's safe to be together now or relatively safe and get back into the world. Some of those strategies we had on the slide around talking about this, validating one another's emotions. And so really looking at this as being out, being social for some children and some adults, as soon as it feels safe, as soon as vaccines are out, they're just going to be there. And it'll be like nothing has changed, like seeing an old friend that you haven't seen in years and you get back together and all of a sudden it just feels like that's where you're meant to be. For others, it's going to take a lot of time because that is a set of skills to practice. It's recognizing how you feel stepping out into a situation. You know, that anxiety may come up. And we've been paying attention to it for a reason for our physical health that might actually hurt our social health to pay attention to it. So acknowledging that, talking about it together, what are you feeling worried about? And then helping develop strategies that you practice together. So anytime you can help a child or, or yourself as an adult anticipate a situation. So to think about, okay, what's going to happen? How do I think I might feel when I get in that space? What could I do in that moment to say it's okay to have this feeling. I'm gonna take a few deep breaths 
and I'm going to move forward anyway. Or what do I need? Do I need to step away and take this slowly? So thinking through that ahead of time, practicing even in small groups or with one-on-one -on -one with friends or family members as it's safe and really seeing it as a step, as a series of skill building steps rather than just uh, how do we do this all of a sudden? Does anyone so else I, have something to add to that? Well, I just have to, I, my role here today seems to be the funny, maybe sort of funny anecdotes, but I'll just, I'll just add one, another one. My, my, my poor kid, he came home after his first day, first day in April of sixth grade on, on site with a few people on, you know, and he said, <laughs> of course he's my kid. So he says, mommy, I need to work on my social interaction skills. <laughs> That's what he said to me. So he he was it was it was really good because he was incredibly aware, um, you know, of of how he's not been. They call it IRL in real life with people, and um, that 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 is presenting some some things he has to get himself back, especially with adults, other adults. He's you know been on the screen with friends, but it's it's a whole different it's a whole scene. So, Allison, did you want to talk about another question that people had? Yeah, no, it's great. Um, I need to work on my social interaction skills IRL as as well. Um, let's do let's do um, we have a great question in the in the Q and A. Um, do you think children who do not have English as their first language? will adapt to in-person classes. And this, I also think, I wanna think not just about students that maybe you know English is not their preferred language or not the language they speak at home, but I also wanna think about students who are differently abled, um, uh, other folks with special sort of special considerations. Um, so the question is, do you think children who do not have English as their first language will adapt to in-person classes? What practices or skills would you recommend to help them make connections with others. I'll let you all decide who goes first. And I love the, the trio of you all responding. Megan, do you wanna go and then I can add in? Yeah, so so I think, um, you know, I think as we phase back in, it's really important to, um, to think whole of everyone. Um, and I, I really think that, um, you know, again, practicing some of the behaviors that we already know are really safe. So. Um, so uh, wearing masks and being together, but you know we want to think equitably as we phase back into schools too, and and really thinking about communicating with classroom teachers and the schools about what your child might need. So um, um, just like we would pre-COVID, I'm really advocating for some of those resources uh, in the school as well. Um, so that's my that's my start to that. So an example would be you know I do. Um, um, there's sometimes a lot of one-on-one -on -one supports that are needed um, and those, those need to be maintained. And for some children, those actually have been maintained over the course of the pandemic. Um, so for some children uh, who are phasing back in, with special, special education services, they may have been receiving them at home or going into the schools um, throughout the pandemic. So different districts, different schools, different states are handling that differently. But um, um, just kind of maintaining that when children are coming back too and other students are there, I think will be really important. Did you wanna say something too, Megan? I was gonna add about children who don't have English as their first language. I think actually there's great potential when they're in person in class because, um, and, and I know Shauna can add to this actually since she wrote a book on <laughs> some of this work, but, um, but I think that that teachers can do so much nonverbally to cue and help um, model information for families, for children who don't have English as a first language to really scaffold the, the, the picking up of content. And I actually think that there's great potential to be in a context with others to help them incre increase their English skills in ways that might be surprising. The other thing I would say about this is it is incredibly important um, in terms of resilience building and in terms of sort of connecting with others. So helping the other part of that question is, what can you do to recommend, right? Helping them make connections. And even, even having one other kid that they can connect with, one friend, one kid, one child who hope, you know, may speak the same language, or even if they don't, um, I, I would have this again, a funny story perhaps, but our friends were here for a year from Norway and my two, daughter and their daughter got to be really good friends. Well, in the first few months, their daughter spoke no English and they were each about seven years old. And my daughter 
and they were playing all the time together and could not communicate, you know, communicate effectively initially. And my daughter would say, I don't want to play with Celia anymore because I think we're playing hide and seek and she thinks we're playing tag and mommy, it's just not working. <laughs> so there, but yet, but yet they kept at it and it was just so incredibly useful for them to keep at it, even though there was this real difference in translation, a breakdown here. But um, I want to let also uh, Shauna to respond to that one. Thanks, Megan. Well, and at the end of the year, those two were inseparable. I remember seeing that. I mean, they did not want to leave each other. Very much, very much. Yes. Friends. And I think that speaks to another part of this too. I mean, one, we can help support skill building, particularly around that social connection. One of the things that becomes harder is that, as Megan McClelland was saying, nonverbal cues are so important to building relationships and connections, and we're doing it through masks. And so that makes it harder to read and understand facial expressions, emotions, what, what students are getting back from their teachers or from their peers. And so looking at how can we help them learn those skills, learn vocabulary, vocabulary to express themselves, their feelings, to be able to ask questions or to interact in that way. And it comes down to both teaching skills to students who don't have English as their first or preferred language, but also the other students in the classroom, how to be inclusive how to reach out knowing they have a friend who speaks another language. And how cool is that? Maybe we can teach each other words in our native languages and then building that inclusive classroom environment so it's not seen as the responsibility of that child or that student who is the one who is speaking another native language or also learning English at the same time to also then be the one who has to advocate for themselves at every turn that you're creating a classroom of students who are doing that for one another. And then thinking about how do we do that for the parents or their family members as well? How do we make sure that you know, those families may or may not have English language skills themselves, may or may not know what it's okay or effective to do in this learning environment in terms of asking for help or support. And so looking at those of you who are parenting educators, educators, or even parents in the community who you're seeing families who might need that extra support, giving a warm handoff, looking for ways to connect them with services and support so that they can be engaged in the way that they want to as well. Let's go to another question in the chat on the Q and A. Uh, do you think that more time alone has potentially helped kids learn more about themselves? What have they gained or lost from this time? My daughter said to me the other day, just to build off of your, your storytelling with your own kiddos, Megan, she said, I realize I'm somebody who needs to be around other people and I didn't get to be around other people very much this year. And I think our, our children and our students have a lot that they can learn if we give them the space to do that and have those conversations with them about what's worked and what hasn't and where can we go from here? but they may need help processing that. Yeah, I um, I agree, Shauna. And I think the other part of that too is that we have been in these, um, we have been in our household units and you know, we have to have those conversations. We have to be open with our kids too about how we're dealing with those conversations to open that conversation for them as well. Um, and I think that's another really important, another, really another important piece of it. You know, I think that it, it really does depend a bit on a child's temperament and their own personality. Some kids have really thrived in a remote um, environment and they've been able to progress maybe at their own speed. Um, if they're highly anxious kids, um, those children, you know, they have really seen some benefits, you know, it's a safe place. Um, for other kids and, you know, I, again, I, I know that I, I have a child who would, would prefer probably to stay in his little boy cave, right, and do his little thing. But I know that also from, it's not good from a parent, from my perspective, it's really important that he build the skills he needs to be able to navigate the world and society. And so 
Um, sometimes, you know, my role, I guess, as the mean mommy, I suppose, is to, and and because this poor kid, you know, I know too much about this, right? Is is that that it, it is important to develop those resilience skills when you have to go back out and in in real life, so to literally, right? And and practice these skills. Um, and, and I was actually pretty shocked to hear my kids say, well, I think I have to practice my social interaction skills. I mean, you know, I thought that was actually quite mature and, and, and you know, aware uh, for, for a 12 year old. And so I think that this ha has really in some ways really benefited kids and many on the other side too, we've seen a real uptick tick in uh, mental health issues and suicide with older um, youth. And so I think it does depend a bit on, on your, your kid and, and temperament. But at the end of the day, I, I guess I come down to, we all need to develop these skills to be able to navigate the world. And, and, and a lot of that is social. And so we have to help our kids develop those too, um, slowly. And, you know, I also think embedded in that as we face back and sort of, um, whether we're back in school already or preparing to go back to school. I mean, you also know your kids best and thinking through um, sort of like we talked about before and building these school, uh, these skills, sorry. And, you know, um, maybe having an outdoor play day with one friend for 30 minutes or 15 minutes. And then, you know, slowly building over time because again, going to school all day or or uh, for me coming to work all day and, you know, for Ada, it's a lot different and it takes, um, it takes something. And, um, you know, those are things that um, we're, we're gaining back and we're working towards, but, um, you know, we're, we're a little bit tired and relearning our schedules and routines too, and just kind of um, building up our confidence and doing that too. So again, sort of skill building, skill building that. I have a, a comment and a question. And I think the comment is that the self-awareness that you all are talking about, I'm, I'm curious if that's an element of self-regulation from a measurement perspective. Um, but then I also just wanna ask, and this is meant to be funny, but everything that you all are talking about goes for adults just as well as it goes for kids, right? Because so many of us in so many ways, like there are, there are those of us who really appreciate being home, doing work from home and, you know, and then others. So, so anyway, I think of my friend, Laura, who is an extrovert and she has really suffered. And then, you know, someone like me, like, if you leave me behind the computer to write something all day, like, that's wonderful. You know, I'm happy there um, for, for a time anyway. So maybe can you tell us a little bit about self-regulation as a as a measure, just briefly, just in case we have graduate students or, or folks who are into that uh, part of the science on the line. And then I, we do have another question or two in chat. So I wanna make sure we get back to that. So the short answer to the measurement question of whether self-awareness or we call it metacognition, if you, if you wanna just give it the official term, right? Is, is being aware of your own thinking. And as we know, as kids get older, their ability to do this is, is actually quite linked to self-regulation and their ability to know when. So it's not always good to be so self-regulated. That, that's actually not so good all the time, right? But when do you need to bring it in? Perhaps when, you know, your flight is canceled and, and you know, you're an adult and you have to figure out how not to lose it and you have two crying kids, um, which has happened. <laughs> and so how do you draw on those skills to be kind of aware of, okay, I know that this is going to be hard and how can I bring it in when I need it. And so I, I do think that that is part that metacognition um, develops early in life, but we don't really see it. Uh, it is a hallmark of, of being sort of self-regulated. Thank you for that. Um, let's go. Now we have two more questions in the Q&A and I realize we've got, um, we're approaching at quarter to quarter till. Um, Family conferences. I want to make sure we define what a family conference is in this question, but the question is, what role may family conferences have in connecting family members? So in, in terms of maybe we could wait and see if, I won't name anyone since I know this is being recorded, um, the person who asked the question would clarify what they mean specifically around family conferences, but one of the things that we 
are seeing and have hope will continue is through our work supporting the Oregon Parenting Education Collaborative or OPEC. So OPEC provides a space for families to gather and through with parenting education support, family workshops and other resources. And with the onset of the pandemic, those in-person groups and classes that help build community, help offer support and normalize that we all need support as parents and family members raising children and youth of any age, that OPEC has been very successful, those parenting hubs on the ground at transitioning that to virtual classes, to bringing families together online through different virtual means to build community in that way. And building that community, just thinking back to that question, is so critical for social support. It's critical for stress reduction. It's critical to be able to demonstrate resilience by finding support in one another and helping one another meet our needs and building a society that's really compassionate. So our hope is that through expanding those opportunities for family connections, that we would be able to continue to increase you know, those supports that youth and families are facing. I mean, I'll take a different def definition of a family conference. That's that's the official. I think that's really helpful. And when I think about just how do we strengthen connections among our own relationships in our lives, um, I think, and I think we can all relate to this, that uh, the importance of um, all of a sudden there are these Zoom family meetings, right? These Zoom connections or FaceTime calls um, that weren't happening before and in ways that that have really brought people closer even though we couldn't see them in person and i think that is a way to connect that even more than we had been doing in the past um, by far and so in some respects i think connection um, through these remote mechanisms has actually encouraged um, and strengthened the relationships we have in our families i don't know if that's the <laughs> definition but i thought i would throw it out well, thank you to Jennifer on the on the call. We got a little more information. Family conferences are part of New Zealand family conferencing, which um, features into their legislation on family group conference conferences. Maybe you all are familiar with that. Can speak to it. No? Cool. So um, Jennifer, reach out. Let us know more. Uh, sounds great. And uh, I want to make sure, Shauna, um, that we that folks in the audience understand the parenting hubs um, and have access to those kinds of resources as well. I think, you know, I think about uh, individualism versus collectivism in our country, and I wonder if, if maybe maybe the COVID is pushing us a little more towards understanding that we actually do need each other. Uh, I don't know, but but you know what I'm learning in this call is that that it's okay to. It's okay to reach out and to acknowledge where there's suffering and how do we do we form these connections. We have, um, well, let me pause. Anything else on family conferencing or family group conferences? Okay, uh, let's, uh, let's go to another question in the Q&A. As the pandemic has impacts um, older students as well, it impacts older students as well in many of the same ways. What plans does Oregon State University have to help ease the transition into in-person instruction? Uh, I am not totally sure that any of us on this call know exactly what Oregon State University plans to do. Uh, chime in if you do, but uh, maybe we could talk about some of the strategies we would hope to see um, uh, for this particular age group, older, older, older kids, young adults. Um, I can speak a little bit to sort of teaching. Um, uh, I taught a first year course in the fall that was um, very focused on actually uh, the, it was focused on the core textbook was a book from Brene Brown um, and the 10 guideposts to wholehearted living. And um, that's something that uh, it's a course within our college to really um, have students be more connected in smaller cohorts. And um, I think that that's a really great way to just for students to get to know each other and, and to find some of their, to connect with other um, students in the college. I also have to say that I've been really impressed with um, our ability to, with the help that we've had at the university to get students the services that they need. Um, and so um, we have, uh, I'm not gonna, possibly is the right term, we have student care networks 
that really help us as instructors to reach out and have people reach out to students where we, we may feel or sense that there is a concern. Um, um, but um, those are some of, the, some of the things that I know about. I think that, I mean, I'll just add in some ways, the transition is already happening even in our, it's a, it's a crazy thing in our Zoom. So I'm reflecting um, upon the Zoom classes that we're teaching. And um, for the first time since this started, I'm teaching 70 undergraduates on Zoom. And, and I just thought this was gonna just go horribly awry, to be honest with you. And how can I get us all through this, you know? And I have been pleasantly surprised by the connection, the connecting I have done with students in ways that even when I'm in class with a hundred students, actually often in class, I don't get the same amounts of feedback or, and it's a really active engaged class I often have. And I'm amazed at the connection that we're doing. And I feel like people are um, making more efforts um, and we're moving back into in-person instruction, but I feel very, in some ways, I feel quite connected to students who are reaching out in chats way more than they might in class um, because they don't wanna speak up in front of a hundred people. They don't necessarily speak up. I said to them this today, just before this, I said, I feel like I talked to myself for an hour and a half. And so hopefully some of this is working. And I would just got this whole slew of chat messages from people saying, this is super interesting. And, you know, I feel like I want to do this in my regular class. This is pretty good. So anyway, I, I don't know that that really gets at what OSU is doing, but I do think that we're making lots of, um, efforts faculty anyway to ease this transition and connect with people now so that it's it's not such an abrupt I think uh, change. I have heard one of my colleagues uh, who's an extension faculty member out in um, a coastal county talk about finally meeting someone in person that they had been working with on zoom you know finally at a vaccine clinic you know we've we've been rallying for months to to organize the community to put things together and they finally you know and that there was there's a lot of like just joy right at at we get to finally be together and it's so wonderful to see you and to meet you and I know um I hope that we we have a lot of that I know it will be a challenge for some too but I I hope that that there's also a lot of joy in seeing one another um we had a great question that um Megan McClelland you you touched on it, but I want to, I want to maybe really answer it. Um, cause, and it's around how, let's be sure we cover, and I'm going to merge this with a physical activity question. Let's be sure we cover real concrete strategies on coping with the anxiety that comes with re-entry. Dare we re-enter too soon, continuing to stay at home? Um, what are what are your sort of number um, number one, two, and three sort of top top tips for for managing this uh, in in our families? What do you all recommend? Well, my first thing as a developmental psychologist is that it's going to depend on your on you and, and your own comfort and what you need and what your kids, if you have kids, what, what their comfort is and their temperament. And so, so I do think you have to take that into account. Some people, um, some kids, if we're talking about kids going back to school, they, they're just going to jump right back in and, and they are just going to find great. My daughter was like this, you know, it was at first, but, but admittedly that it was very anxiety producing actually the in ways that was somewhat surprising, but then um, after it was just this joy of connecting, as you said, again, in IRL in real life, you know, and so, so I do think that it depends quite a bit on, on the kid or the person and the temperament, what they need. And then if you have one who, or yourself, who um, takes a while to adjust to new things, uh, which I can relate to, uh, you have to ease into it. And I think people have mentioned this already, you know, you really do have to ease into interactions uh, slowly but surely and and, um, and start, in, especially if you're concerned about safety, I mean, doing things outside, you know, um, you know, with masks and uh, making sure that kids feel comfortable. Um, starting small, I guess, um, is, is what I would say, um, but I'll let others answer too. Um, 
I think Allison, you know that um, um, physical activity, as I've mentioned before, is something that I think is really important. But I, um, I myself have uh, with some with some projects that are ongoing on campus. I have started um, coming in more often. I have to say that the top two things that were on my mind, um, which I have in zoning year, pack a lunch and uh, know where my office keys are. So those are two. To put up. But I think to that point, like it really is a slow, you know, I, I had to do it slowly for myself. If I have to do this slowly for myself, like we have to do this for our families. And actually we have to debrief about it. I think that that's really important. I mean, I, I say it, it's a joke, but I share with some friends like, hey, don't forget to pack a lunch and like bring your office keys. And for someone else, it might be something different. Um, I also, I bike to work. Um, I did pre-pandemic and then, you know, I walked to the basement for the past year to go to work, but like, that's, that's actually a major, that's a major change in my day. And for me, it's for the better that bike ride to work is something that um, I really need. And actually it was helpful, but then it was helpful for me to go home and talk about that with my family. And, you know, then it brings up what other people need and, and um, what they're anticipating as we phase back to school and phase back, phase back to work. Another thing I'll add too is just that you know, I think it's easy to hold that idea in mind that the pandemic came because it came on so suddenly and it was like a flip switched and all of a sudden our lives were turned upside down that at some point we'll flip the switch in the other way and we'll go back to how we used to be. And preparing ourselves, preparing our children that that may not be how it is that we are phasing back in and coming to understand what the next phase of normal looks like for us, that we might not want to go back because there are things that you have probably learned about yourself, learned about your children, that the university has learned about how we teach and how access has opened up for students in ways that it wasn't there before, but also others probably fell through the cracks and couldn't access their education. And the same is true for children at all levels. So looking at, how do we really learn from this? What can we do to make our society better? And how can we just hold each other in that place of compassion when we, like you said, Megan, about like remembering your keys and remembering a lunch and those simple things that we have to get used to doing again, while also looking at what are some of the big things that we shouldn't do again if they were problematic or, they, or we've learned more from that now. So how do we ease back in and really learn? You all are wonderful. I, um, we've got just three minutes until the top of the hour. So I am watching, watching the Q and A, but I think this is a wonderful time to remind all of our listeners. So we're ushering in compassion. We're making sure we talk with each other, with people we care about, about what's happening. It's always a good idea to play with the dog in the yard or take a walk around the block, or at least walk outside in the sun and wave your arms around, right? A little something like that. Um, of course, there's a lot more to it, but um, we'll stop there. Any closing, any closing thoughts? We really appreciate uh, your time with all of us today. Um, I just wanted to say, and I, I actually think this one belongs to Megan and Shauna, but it was a good reminder when I saw it on our slide set for today is that we're talking about students and children and phasing back to school and um, we, we can't, it's harder to take care of our children if we're not taking care of ourselves. And so I just really want to reiterate that um, all of these strategies as they've come up for our kids are also just really important for us to, um, and, and to make sure that we're, we're, we're reflecting, that we're debriefing, that we're getting what we need so that we can make sure that our, our people have what they need. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you all so much. I think this is where Casey is gonna come on and we're all gonna wave goodbye until next time and turn off our cameras maybe. Hopefully right? we'll see each other soon, you guys. It's great to see, see you. And this is always fun. It's always fun hanging out. Thanks for the opportunity, you guys. This is great. Thank, thank you. you, panelists. Really, really appreciate it. And thank you also, Allison. You know, I, I, Megan, your, your phrase of boy cave it's good for us to all get out of our caves. And even though that's become the safe space that we were told to like, you know, stay at home, stay in your cave. Now it's, you know, also good to venture out both, you know, physically and, and emotionally and mentally. So really appreciate all of you. 
Uh, and thank you for a really wonderful uh, webcast today. So um, also thank you to you, our audience member, for your wonderful questions for today. Uh, today was the first episode of the fourth season of the series of the Public Health Insider. The next episode will be two weeks from today on Monday, April 26th at 4 p.m. titled Manage Your Growing Everyday Stress. So we have more wonderful faculty from the college uh, coming on. So to register for that episode and for the rest of season four, uh, go ahead and visit osualum.com slash public health webcasts.